At some point, when you were learning how to program, you've probably encountered or written code that looked like the following. You start with an empty array, and then you add elements to it one by one. Accessing any of the five elements in your array is really quick and simple through an index. You also have the ability to remove elements from your array fairly easily. All of these features are cornerstones of a fundamental data structure called the dynamic array. One key feature of dynamic arrays are that all of these insert, access, and remove operations are incredibly efficient. When you are learning the intricacies of a programming language though, it's easy to just note the features of these dynamic arrays and move on to cooler applications of these data structures. But underneath the hood, there's a lot of clever thought that's put into making these arrays extremely efficient. In this video, we're going to kind of peel away the abstraction and really understand how these dynamic arrays work. And most importantly, I hope that you can come away from this video with the perspective of how you might have gone about inventing this robust data structure. So let's start to think about how we might start. Whenever you start off with a somewhat ambiguous problem, we generally want to simplify it. We're going to start off with this pretty reasonable simplification. Let's first try to build a data structure that focuses on only accessing and inserting elements quickly. So for now, we're going to forget about the remove operation. The first thing we have to acknowledge is that whenever we want to start adding many pieces of data, we're going to have to store it somewhere. The storage hub on your computer has a large amount of memory, all split into nice, organized and evenly spaced blocks. And whenever you want to start storing some data in a computer, we must allocate a small fixed length portion of this memory. This is a key constraint. We can't just say we're going to use some portion of memory and then try to use more. The computer is not going to be a fan of that. In computer science, we often call this a fixed length array and many programming languages allow you to create a fixed length array easily. So, what do we have going for us with this fixed length array in terms of getting to our final goal of a dynamic array? Well, we can place data into this array very quickly. We just have to tell the computer to store the respective data in that portion of memory. Once the data is inserted, we can also access elements quickly. The computer knows where the fixed memory segment starts and each piece of data is stored in an evenly spaced block, so it's quite easy to find an element using an index. Anyways, so it looks like the scheme works perfectly if we just had four pieces of data. Adding elements is super fast, and so is accessing them. But when we are creating a dynamic array, we are often not going to know how much data we have ahead of time. We could be dealing with a few hundreds of samples, or we could be dealing with billions. Whenever we create a fixed length array, there's a chance that we run out of space and have to add space. Let's think about our options. What should we do when we get a fifth element? The first thing that comes to mind is we can just create a new fixed length array to accommodate additional data. Once the original fixed length array reaches its capacity, we create a new array of length one more than the previous array. Now since when we created this new fixed length array of size 5, it's initially empty, we're going to have to copy the elements one by one to the new array. And then when we add a new element that fills the capacity of this array, we're going to have to repeat the process. So you might be looking at the scheme and thinking, this feels wasteful and well, just kind of plain bad. This just can't be the right way to do it. Let's follow this intuition and see if we can develop a way to quantify how bad this really is. Let's start with some simulations and try to determine the amount of work it takes to insert a particular number of elements. What do I mean by amount of work? Well, in a sense I'm being intentionally vague because there are many interpretations to this. But let's ask ourselves, if we were doing this process by hand, what are things that take effort? Well, 
it definitely takes some small unit of effort to insert some data into an array. And it also takes some effort to draw and keep track of the boxes that represent an array. So let's actually count these two things. We'll count the number of insertions, and we'll also count the length of the current array that we are using. The first metric will give us a sense of how much time this scheme takes, and the second metric will give us an idea of the amount of space required to execute this scheme. So let's run this and see what happens. If we start with four elements and insert elements one by one, this is what it looks like. Remember, we have to create a new fixed length array of size one more than the previous array and copy things over each time we have a new element that does not fit in the previous array. One thing to note here is that I'm only going to count the final array as new space we're using, since we can easily get rid of previous arrays when we generate the new array. After 18 elements, we end up having 165 insertions and our final array uses 18 units of space. If we continue doing this, after 1,000 elements, we end up having around 500,000 insertions and 1,000 units of space. Going even further, after processing 1 million elements, we have over 500 billion insertions and 1 million units of space. To give you a sense for how intensive this scheme is, I ran this on my personal computer and it took about 12 hours. These are some nice data points. But what about in general? Some of you may have noticed the pattern here, and we can absolutely use this pattern to define a more general mathematical function of how our insertions in space grow with the function of the number of elements. The space function is quite straightforward. If we're inserting n elements using the scheme, we'll be using n units of space. How do we go about counting the number of insertions? Let's see if we can write it out. Assuming we first initialize four blocks of memory, as we've done so far, we first insert four elements. Then we resize and copy over four elements. Then we add our fifth element. Then we resize again, copying over all the five elements, and then add a sixth element. And this pattern continues until we insert our last n elements. We can rewrite the sum into a little bit of a nicer format to work with. If this resulting summation isn't immediately familiar to you, there's a cool geometric way to derive the sum. When we sum these elements, we can think of it as building a triangle of base n. And our total sum is the number of blocks in this final triangle. How can we go about figuring that out? Well, notice that if we copy over this triangle and rotate it, the number of blocks in our triangle is half the blocks in the rectangle. The number of blocks in the rectangle is equivalent to the area of the rectangle where each unit is a single block. This means that our rectangle has n times n plus 1 blocks. Consequently, the result of the sum is n times n plus 1 divided by 2, which is also sometimes called Gauss's formula. Simplifying our final expression, this then means that the number of insertions is 1 half n squared plus 1 half n minus 6. This assumes that we of course have at least 4 insertions. Okay, so now that we have a precise way to quantify the scheme, it seems like our resizing scheme is lacking. What can we do to make it better? Specifically, can we see if we can reduce the number of insertions since that seems to be our biggest bottleneck? Think about this for a moment. Feel free to pause the video and brainstorm. The first thing that pops out as an issue here is that every time we resize the array, we are only increasing its capacity by one. What if instead we increase its capacity by something larger, like eight? This allows us to not have to resize the array every single time we insert an element, so on the surface, it looks like it's already better. Let's repeat our analysis to verify this. After processing 18 elements, we now end up having 36 insertions and 20 units of space, which is a definitely improvement. If we try to scale it up to 1000 elements, 
This is what the computer has to do while processing this resize for the 997th element. After inserting our 1000th element, we have 63,500 insertions and 1004 units of space. And for 1 million elements, we have about 62.5 billion insertions and 1 million 4 units of space. In general, the number of units of space we need to insert any n elements is going to be at most n plus 8 units of space. We can also find a more general version of the number of insertions, although the algebra is a little bit more involved. I don't want to get too deep into the matrix used here, since it's not really the point, but a quick summary is that since the sequence that we have here is a sum of evenly spaced numbers, we can calculate the average and multiply it by the number of elements in the sequence. And to make the algebra work out nicely, we assume that after n insertions, the array is completely filled with elements. This assumption doesn't generally affect the trend of this function. It gives us a good estimation. So let's take a moment to take stock of our analysis thus far. We found the general trend of these two resizing schemes. Clearly, resizing by 8 elements is a smaller function for all reasonable inputs. But how much better is it really? Remember, for 1 million elements, we still have 62.5 billion insertions. And more generally, what happens when n becomes very large? What's going to dominate? When n gets very large, the term that plays the biggest role in this output is the n squared term which both functions share. This leads into a very important concept when it comes to quantifying the performance of data structures. When we were coming up with these general functions, we did a lot of work with evaluating summations. In reality, computer scientists are notoriously lazy. We just want the least amount of information that captures the essence of the performance of a data structure. Computer scientists generally don't care about the specifics of the exact function that captures the performance of a data structure or an algorithm. They care more so about the dominating term and use that to encapsulate what we call the runtime of an algorithm. They use a specific notation for this called big O notation. In this example, inserting n elements into a dynamic array with this resizing scheme takes O of n squared time and O of n space. And using big O notation, we can see that even though the resize scheme of adding eight blocks at a time may initially seem better, on a large scale, it doesn't actually perform any better than our first resizing scheme. And we actually can generalize this. There's nothing special about eight elements. If we perform a resize of k elements, even if k is a very large number, in the grand scheme of things, our dynamic array still performs n insertions in O of n squared time. It's also worth noting that a scheme where k is very large is not very desirable since a large chunk of the allocated blocks in our dynamic array will not be used. The question now is can we do better than this? In the next video, I'll show you how programming languages such as Python and Java implement these data structures using a surprisingly simple and clever trick that reduces the runtime for n insertions to O of n time and O of n space. If you enjoyed this video, I would really appreciate it if you took a moment to like the video and subscribe to get notified when future videos come out. If you would like to support this channel, check out the Patreon page linked in the description. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.